The act of baptism, just a tremendous opportunity for people to, to recognize, to be recognized, and for them to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to talk to you today about the act of baptism. What is it all about? We could, there's a lot of information in, in between these pages regarding baptism, water baptism. So we cannot spend the whole day just taking a seminar and going through all the various aspects of baptism, but I've honed it down basically to four main points that we need to understand, especially those who are being baptized in water and those who have already been baptized in water. You need to be refreshed. Your mind needs to re be refreshed in knowing what has taken place in my life. Because as these people today are baptized in water, it is also witnessing to those it is uh, de declaring to those who have already been baptized what you did. It's, so it's not just those who are being baptized, but it's also a message, a reminder. Please listen now. It's a reminder to those who have been baptized of what took place, what happened in your life, what does it mean to me. So we want to make sure that we're focusing on this act of baptism. It is not just being dunked in water. It holds a whole lot more than just, I go in the water, I get dunked, I come out, and oh good, now I'm all set. It goes much further than that. So we all want to understand what it's all about. right? Because John the Baptist came. There was 400 years of silence where no prophet was speaking. The word of the Lord wasn't present. John the Baptist came forward baptizing people in water, declaring the kingdom of the Lord is at hand, declaring that uh, the repentance for the remission of sins, repentance in Luke chapter 3, verse 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 3 says, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, meaning for the removal of sins. Now, I'm going to ask that you also would turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. John the Baptist broke 400 years of silence where the word of the Lord was not present, was not made known, no prophet was speaking, 400 years. And all of a sudden, John the Baptist comes forth and speaks and declares that the kingdom of God is at hand, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, preaching baptism for the repentance, for the remission of sins. All of a sudden, we find that the church is born. Peter declares, all of a sudden, by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter comes forth and gives his first sermon. And we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38, says this. Is everyone there? Acts chapter 2, verse 37, says, Now when they heard this, let's stop right there. He just got done declaring the entire aspect of the good news, the history of where they've come from, where they are. He just declared as to what has taken place. Well, they're empowered now by the Holy Spirit and the people. And he's explaining to them what has taken place. It says, now when they heard this, they were what? Cut to the heart. Pierced to the heart. It cut right to the core of their being. That they realized that were sinners cut off from God. If a person doesn't have that, if a person's not cut to the heart, if a person doesn't see themselves as a sinner, if a person doesn't see themselves as cut off from God, if they don't care about the kingdom that's coming, if all they're concerned with is their own little life that they're dealing with on this side of heaven, on this side of the cross, if all they're concerned with is what they see, then this is going to be all meaningless to them. But when a person understands, when the Holy Spirit makes it real, when it cuts you to the heart and you realize that this is truth, all of a sudden, they turn, cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? If a person does not have that in their heart, then they'll never call upon the name of the Lord. What shall we do? Death is everywhere, grabbing hold of everyone. There's no escape, and everyone in this room has heard the saying, there are two things you can count on. Everyone knows it. Death and taxes. It's everywhere. 
But when you realize that death is not just something that we deal with in the physical, but we've been cut off from God, the fall of man has dismissed God as insignificant and has made us fallen from him, and there's no way back except through Christ Jesus. A provision has been made. A person has been made. A bridge has been established. A road has been established. A narrow way. Now the way, the truth, the life, this is the way, and it is the person, Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, walking among us, gave his life that we might have eternal life. What shall we do? And what's Peter's answer in verse 38? First thing he says, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A very important scripture to grasp and to understand. Repent is to turn from the life, the conduct, the character, the concerns, the worldly ways. Our old life is to turn away from and to turn to the things of God. Repentance has been made fun of over the ages through various comedy shows and through a variety of scorning that takes place and mocking. Right now, if we were to go around, if you go out on the streets, which you did on Saturday, Dennis, and just went, repent, 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 everyone would just basically laugh at that. It's just, right, it's because the, the word has been taken down now to a comical scene. You've seen it even now with cartoons where people wear billboards on them and they, they make fun of the whole idea of repent for doom is at hand. When in actuality, that's exactly the scriptures. Repent for doom is at hand. The wrath of God is about to fall and a provision has been made. Savior has come. The ark of the Lord is, be, is being built. Come and enter all ye and receive salvation. For the wrath is a, a cataclysmic event is about to come and there's safety only in the ark called Christ. So we shall enter into the ark called Christ. When he shuts the door, it's shut. And you can be on the outside from now until the day that you take your last breath and be knocking on the outside, but there's no way in. Now is the day for salvation. Now is the day where we call upon the Lord. Repent means to turn from and to turn to. To turn from the old and to turn to the new. To turn from the kingdom of the world, the kingdoms of this age, the kingdoms that are under the dominion of the God of this age, and to turn to the one true almighty God. Not the usurper. I turn away from the conspirator. I turn away from the usurper. And I want the almighty one. Amen. That's what it is. First of all, repent. And then what does it say? Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptized is an act that takes place in our lives in obedience to the things of God. Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, he said, go into all the world, baptize them. Baptize. Meaning, number one, the act of baptism is an act of immersion. Immersion. I-M-M-E-R-S-I-O-N. Immersion. Meaning to be totally, totally submerged. The act of baptism, number one, is an act of immersion. Baptizo. To be totally submerged. To be overwhelmed by. Now, everyone in this room, whether young or old, at some point you've had a bath. I know that to be true, because if it wasn't, you'd be alone. <laughs> <laughs> to take a bath is to be submerged, overwhelmed, totally under. I know even as a young boy, I used to love going under and just blowing bubbles under, seeing it. But eventually, you have to come up, right? Do you remember? Death, life. Under the water leads to death. Above the water leads to life. Right? He made you alive. Remember that message? He made you alive. You're alive. You're walking alive. You're walking a path of life. He made us alive. But in that, making alive is to return from the old and turn to the new. He made us alive and repentance turns from. And the act of immersion is declaring that we are totally overwhelmed and we are totally 
in, not part, but all, submerged, not just in water, but in the body of Christ Jesus. That's what it's saying. Philip baptized a Ethiopian eunuch. He was on a chariot heading back towards Africa. And Philip, by the Spirit, came upon him and explained the scriptures. The Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8, he's reading the book of Isaiah and he goes, what's he talking about? I don't understand. See, that's the first step. You want to learn. You want to know. I don't understand. I'm reading it, but I don't understand. Who's he talking about? Philip explains to him the gospel. What is he talking about? Explains the gospel to him. Then the Ethiopian eunuch, the first thing he says is, says, look, there's plenty of water right here. Can't I be baptized right here? Boom, baptism took place. There's plenty of water. There's water here. The whole idea of being submerged. But in that, we need to recognize that this whole idea of immersion means all, not part. The whole idea of immersion is not so much that we got to make sure we get every little hair and follicle in. But the whole idea of immersion is to make sure that you understand that it's all of you in the body of Christ, not just part. God's not looking for part of you. He's looking for all of you. I'm not looking for part of God in my life. I want all of him. So we are in the body. This whole idea of the body that you see before you, or if you look in the mirror and you see your body, you have parts of the body that are in the body. It's part of the whole body. Even though just a member, it's still part of the whole body. All of it is part of it. Yes. So immersion is not just a matter of being dunked in water and coming out and saying, oh good. But rather the act of immersion is, to, is the declaration that all of you is going into the body of Christ. Not in part, but the whole. Number two, here's the big one. Number two, the act of baptism, baptism, the act of baptism is one of identification. Identification. That's the big one. Identification. You align yourself with. You begin to be known as. Do you remember in Antioch, in the book of Acts, it says the, the church in Antioch, a little church in Antioch, growing and blossoming, flourishing. That's where they first were called Christians. The first time that they're ever called Christians was because Christians meant little Christ. Ones who looked just like Christ. Their lives reflected that they were following Christ. People came and says, Christians. Ones who look like, follow after, disciples of the Christ. So in this, they were identified with. Now, when you were baptized in this culture, in this Jewish culture, it was equivalent to being baptized in water in an Islamic country. To be able to be in an Islamic country and say, I'm a Christian, think of it now. Go to any Islamic, totally Islamic government country that is really now living for Islam. Go there and say, as your, go before your own family and say, I'm a Christian. I've given my life to God. I'm born again and I've, I'm renouncing Allah and I am choosing Jesus Christ, the one true only God. If you make it out of the country, it was the Lord who helped you. Your own family will turn on you. Called honor killings. Because you have identified to another. You have renounced and therefore you have received. And in receiving, you have renounced the old and choose the new. You therefore have chosen to be identified with Jesus, the Almighty Savior, for the remission of sins. I want to be baptized. I want to be identified with Him. In so doing, you just cut yourself off from your old culture. Being in this culture, this Jewish culture, you did the same thing. That's why there was such persecution by the Jews towards those who chose Christ because they rejected them and threw them out of the homes. Through, you couldn't do business. You were therefore not just isolated or renounced or turned away from, but you were actually persecuted. Persecuted not like in today where I'm being persecuted, they're not talking to me. That's where we're at today. That's our level of persecution. Do you know they called me a name? 
But today, you go back into this day, persecution is not just mom and dad not liking you, not just brother and sister not talking to you, not your neighbor giving you a scowl, but picking you up with, and putting you in the center of town and hitting you with rocks. That's persecution. And then when you see that, the bystanders witness the testimony, the good testimony, the Spirit moves on their lives and they get saved. But it costs you your blood. Now that's persecution. So when we're looking in identification, we have to look at it that when you identify with Christ, it means that you are renouncing the old and welcoming the new. In this identification, you are willingly, you want to choose God. You want people to know what you believe in, what you're for. Your outward expressions reveal your inward heart. Is that not so? Your outward expressions reveal your inward heart. That's why a person can say, I'm a Christian. But their outward lives will prove whether that's so. True? Their outward lives will pro prove whether they really are identifying with Christ. Or is it just words? Is it just pretense? Are you covering up something? So when we're instead, when we're declaring, I'm a Christian, let your life follow after it because I want to be identified with them. The act of baptism is saying before God, before heaven, before earth, before his holy angels, before all seen and before all unseen, before visible and invisible, you are declaring, I want to belong to Jesus. I want the almighty God to have his sway over me. I want to live for him. And in this, we can say, yes, that's right, but let our lives prove it. Because if our lives, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, do not prove that we're following after Christ, then it's just a show called pretense. It's just a parade of self-righteousness. Instead, let us truly be people who are choosing Christ. I do hope that this is helpful to your heart to realize that each person in this room must make a declaration in your lives, in my life, that we are not just in word, but in our lives. Our lips and our life must match that we have decided to choose God and live for him now and forevermore. The act of baptism is proving that. You don't go. Now, I don't think you do. But if you go to a Red Sox game, I don't see anybody here, and I'm assuming most people are Red Sox fans, but because we live in this area, but a Yankee fan, or wherever you're at, or a Minnesota, if you go to one game, and you're a Red Sox fan, you don't wear a Yankee cap. <laughs> uh, not if you're a Red Sox fan, right? If you're a Red Sox fan, and meaning that you follow it, you watch it, you like it, you look for it, you want to know the scores, you know the pitches, you're a fan that you kind of, you're, fan meaning what? That you're kind of like a follower after. That you, you, you want to know and you make known, you get the bumper stickers on the back, you got the things, you wear the hat, you got the shirt, you got the t-shirt, you got the, everything about you is showing what? That I'm identified that I'm what? I'm a Red Sox fan. The outward proves, you don't have to go around and shout, Red Sox fan, Red Sox fan. <laughs> the very hat will show it. The outward expression will declare what you're for. True? You don't have to say anything. If someone comes and says, so for you're for the Red Sox? What do you think? <laughs> hat, shirt, bumper stickers, right? Tickets. Everything about you, your outward expression is showing that that's what you're for. Or whatever team that you choose. It's all just kind of on the temporal anyway, isn't it? If I said who won the World Series 50 years ago, you don't know. So in this, this all passes away. All of this passes away. All of this all of a sudden just becomes that no one's going to really remember or recognize. Baseball's only 100 years old. What were the great sports in time past? Nobody knows, nobody cares, nobody really delves into it. It's not consuming our lives. But what they were, they identified themselves with. That's the key. The act of baptism is identification. Republicans don't put Democratic stickers on the bumper. Democrats don't put Republican stickers on their bumper. Somebody who's a Democrat not wearing red t-shirts. So in this, there's an identification. What's taken forth outward? Islamic people, 
People who choose to serve Islam, Allah, aren't wearing Jewish caps going into the, to the mosque. True? And vice versa. That the, the Jewish man is not going into, into the synagogue and saying, oh, that's right, my head has to be covered and putting on a wrap. True? Because they're identified with another. You yourselves, all of us, have chosen to follow after Christ, thereby our outward expression identifies what we really are. So, what your outward life looks like, you look at it. No one has, I don't have to say, okay, what have you been doing all past week and I'll tell you who you're serving. You yourself will know. You don't have to tell me, everyone knows. Maybe you're serving gluttony. Maybe you're serving laziness. Maybe you're serving, and all you care about is getting something more in this world, the getting and the gaining. Maybe you're serving your children. Maybe all you care about is just getting the love of your kids to love you. Maybe you're serving your parents. That, oh, I just wish that mom and dad would love me. Then I'd be fulfilled. No, you won't. Nothing satisfies except him. Oh, if I could just get this toy, if I could just get that, if I could just get those tickets, if I could just get that bigger house, if I just had, if I just had, if I just had, it'll never satisfy until you have identification with Christ fully and wholly. That's what counts. That's the only thing that counts. What you are dealing with, what I'm dealing with, our whole life will prove. Just look over your past month, look over the past year as to what's taken place, and it will declare who your gods really are. In this, we want to be identified with Christ, and being baptized is identification. I'm a follower, I'm a believer of Christ Jesus, Lord and Savior of all. Amen. Amen. That's what it's all about. That's what it must be. I have decided that my praise will not be squandered on anything less than Jesus Christ. I have decided that the moments of life that he has given me, I have decided that the moments that he has given me, whether I've got five more or 50 more or 50 years more, God forbid, in this, 102, tell you, that's a long time. <laughs> Another 50 years. So in this, think of it. Everything that he has given to us, possessions, breath, Everything that he has given unto us, uh, anything that comes into our hands, talents, any abilities, friendships, relationships, whatever it is, don't squander it on anything less than Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit in your life. If it's not the Holy Spirit, meaning the spirit of holiness, meaning God's spirit, then you're squandering it and giving it to a spirit that's not him. Somebody who's parading themselves as a God but is not God. This is the time to choose Christ. And baptism is making that declaration. That you want to be identified with him. That you defend it. You express it. You promote it. You want to project it. You support it. I am a believer. I would think. I'm going on a limb. I would think that every person in this room who, who knows me somewhat knows that I'm a believer. I would think that there's been enough over the past three years that you would know he's a believer. In that, you should be able to look at my wife and be able to say, she's a believer. Not because we got up and said so. Not because we just were, well, they were baptized, so they must be okay. But you have seen a life that followed after the baptism that reflects that that thing had meaning. That that act had meaning. Yes? If not, then it was just formality. Just ritual. We're not going through ritual today. We're not going through formality today. We're not going through some sort of uh, righteous act in order for it to look like we're going. Because all you're doing is fooling yourself. Instead, let your life reflect that you are a believer. You may be, just like myself, not where you'd like to be, but thank God you're not where you were. But you're on the move. You're looking for, I'm a seeker after God. I'm a servant of the Lord, and I want more of him in my life. I'm identifying myself with his death and with his resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he has died, has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Amen? Amen. Look at this now. Baptized into his death. The baptism, you are identifying with his death. In the baptism, when you're coming up out of the water, you're recognizing, I'm going to live in the newness of life. We're baptized into his death, verse 4, buried with him. But as Christ was raised from the dead, if we are dead with him, we shall also be raised with him. And it says at the end of verse 4, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Newness of life. This is the way he wants us to walk. Walk not as the old way, but the new way. What is that new way? Walking in the Spirit. Learning of who He is in my life. Walking in the Spirit. Walking in such a way that the character, the conduct, and the concerns of the Holy Spirit are yours. That He is in you. The old is passing away. Behold, the new has come, has come, and is coming. You're identified with Him now and forevermore. Listen now. And write this down if you've got notes. Identification will lead to dedication. Identification will lead to dedication. If you're identified with him, then it will lead to a dedicated life. That in this, we need to recognize that this is more than just preaching church. Let's get through the ritual. Let's get to the party. This has to deal with that you have decided to be a follower of Christ Jesus. I want identification and it will lead you to a life of dedication. So in this, we've decided that I want to be dedicated to the things of God. Amen. It's not just an option. It's a must. The absolute truthfulness of it is I've decided I want to be dedicated to the Lord. We dedicate kids when they're born. We dedicate them. There's nothing in the Bible that says that you must do that. But the whole idea of dedication is that the parent, the church is hoping, trusting, praying that my child will be identified with the people of God. That they will be in the marriage supper of the Lamb that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. That you want to be identified with Christ. That when all is said and done and death has its final say, you're standing. You want to be identified that when death has its final say. And everything and everyone has taken their final breath. And Christ Almighty is standing on Mount Zion. When everything is done and death has had its way and everything goes into the lake of fire, you're standing. That's what you're looking for. You're identified with Christ Jesus. He's mine and I'm his. Let no man's scorn shake you from that. Let not your feet be moved. Hold fast and stand fast. I have decided that worldly ways will not tempt me away. I have decided that I am going to be a follower of Christ Jesus and none other. The world says that's foolishness. The world says have fun, be merry, uh, take it easy, relax, enjoy today for who knows tomorrow we shall die. You don't know how true that is. Dead is dead. And there's no more say than the judgment. And in this, let's take it serious that we are identified with him. Number three, quicker one. Baptism is an act of illustration. Bapt baptism is an act of illustration. You're illustrating something. Illustration. Before heaven, before earth, before visible and invisible. Something is being seen. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. One, one book over. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Chapter 12 verse 13. In the middle of this entire chapter that deals with spiritual gifts, and everyone seems to focus on the spiritual gifts that they end up missing, this verse 13, which is the power of it all. 
Verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Wait a minute, let's stop right there. By one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Knowing that baptism is an act of immersion, totally submerged, who's actually doing the baptism? For by one spirit, who's actually doing the baptism? The spirit. So when, when the pastor and you are in the water, and we submerge you in water, and you come out of the water, that is illustrating a deeper truth. That is just an illustration. The act is illustrating what you know took place in your heart and in your life and in the core of your being. I have been in the death of Christ. I want to be identified with him in the life of Christ to walk in the newness of life. I'm illustrating that the baptism, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God is the one who's baptizing me, meaning putting me into the body of Christ. Not in part, but the whole. Boy, I hope that makes sense to you and I hope that has truth to it and I hope I know it has truth to it, but to you. And I hope that you're receiving it, especially those who are deciding to be baptized today. Verse 13 says this, For by one spirit we were all immersed, baptized into one body, which is what? The body of Jesus Christ. Whether we are Jew or Greek, meaning it doesn't matter whether you are of the religious, of the, of the Jewish, or whether you are of the Gentile, the Greeks who did not know God. We're all baptized into one, whether we're slave or free, doesn't matter have all been made to drink into one spirit, the spirit of the living God. The baptism declares, illustrates, it makes it manifest in the visible realm that all can see, visible and invisible, before all of God, his holy angels, and every evil spirit is going to look upon you today. And don't think it's not. Hear me now. Don't think for one second that this is not going to be more than just the church body coming together and taking a look and seeing what's taking place. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit will be the one that My hand is His hand on your heart. Your knees bending is your pride giving in to the Spirit of the living God. Totally going into the water and coming forth, I belong to the body of Christ. Now think of it, that illustrated act. If all of a sudden next year, two years, you decide not to live that way, think Think of what you just said. Because you made a declaration and illustrated before all that you belong and identify with, and now you turn your back and go back to the old. In so doing, you therefore say, I have known you and I don't care. I'm indifferent towards and I deny you. And he himself said, if you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Think of the seriousness of it all. And yet today, many have just looked at it as, well, well, that's just kind of like Bible stuff. It's truth. I declare to you today the truth. With as much conviction and confidence that God can muster in me, I declare to you with the tongue that he's given to me, connected to the spirit that he's given me, I declare to you the truthfulness of Christ that this is in fact so. That you are making an illustration that you are baptized into the body of Christ. It's the Spirit who will baptize you and put you into the body of Christ. And it says so right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Didn't matter whether you were Jew or Greek, whether you're a slave or free, doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, what history, what past. You don't know what I've done, Pastor. You don't know where I've been. I've done. It doesn't matter what your station of life is. If you believe in Christ Jesus, He will have you walk in the newness of life. Just repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Does it mean that it's going to cost you? Yeah, it's going to cost you your old life. Gee, I'm going to lose all my fun? What you call fun is actually bondage. He'll set you free. Lastly, number four. Baptism is an act of illumination. Illumination. There's something about the obedient act of baptism that sets you free. That act of obedience that makes you aware of his goodness and his greatness. So many times I've seen people not want to take the step towards baptism. Like, oh, well, it's just in the water and it's no big deal. When I was a baby and I was baptized early. That was your decision? Instead of realizing that 
that when you take that act of baptism, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Go into all the world and baptize them. How many times we see the whole idea of baptism, meaning, uh, again, that, uh, that identification. It illuminates the mind. Something opens up the mind. An enlightenment takes place. Obedience all of a sudden comes forth. And something happens in our being where we start becoming illuminated. Why? Because a clear conscience starts in your, in your, in your being. A clear conscience towards God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. 1 Peter, just go towards the end of your Bibles, before Revelation and before John. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism is one of immersion, totally submerged. Baptism is identification. You're ident identifying with him which identification will lead to dedication. Number three, baptism is an act of illustration. You're illustrating before heaven and earth, visible, seen and unseen. You're declaring an illustration that you've been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Number four, baptism is an act of illumination, a clear conscience towards God. Look at it says in verse 21, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. And now it declares what it's not. What isn't it? It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. Look at that. It's not. It's not going in the water and washing up. Listen now. Baptism is not going in the water and washing up. If that was so, then everyone could just take a bath, take a shower, clean up, and we're all sinless. But instead, no matter how much we scrub, even down to the rawest of skin, you'll find you're still sinful. There's only one way to have a clear conscience before God, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit baptizing you into the body of Christ. This in its saying, verse 21, this not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Amen? It's an illumination. You now were once blind, but now you see. You were once poor, but now you're rich. Let the weak say, I am strong. Because why? Because something's happened to me. The Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, I've been submerged into the body of Christ. I'm resurrected. I'm walking in the newness of life. And I'm now going to live for Him now and forevermore. I'm living a life of repentance. I'm not just, I've repented. I'm going to live a life of repentance. I'm going to get up every morning and say no to the old and yes to the new. I'm going to live a life of repentance. I'm not going to have lips of praise. I want a life of praise. I want to speak of him and what he's done in my life. How he's turning my life around. Will the enemy come? Absolutely. You can count on it. And even more so since you are going to take this act. Because why? Because he wants to shame God in your life. He wants to shame God in your life. It's not that you're a big fish. It's not like, whoa, I've got to be afraid. Boy, did you see that? They gave their life to God. We're in trouble now. No way. They want to, no matter how small or how great, the enemy will come upon you for this great purpose, to shame Christ in your life. That's what he's after. I'm not such a big fish that, boy, I'd better go after Gary and stop him. Boy, we got he wants to shame God in my life. If he can strike the shepherd, then he knows he's got the body. And so in this, he wants to shame God. So, we are dedicated believers. No, I've decided. I'm going to live for God. You are going to either shame God or you're going to shame the enemy. Shame the enemy. You have no sway over me. No say. You're not going to tempt me. No. Though tested, I want to be found steadfast and sound. I want to know him. And when he kind of draws, when God draws away and you feel like, like the heavens brass and not answering, in this you just become a pursuer. You keep reading. You keep coming on service. You keep pursuing. You keep looking for. I know you're here because you said... 
You'll never leave me or forsake me. I know you're with me. I don't feel you, but I know you're with me. And all of a sudden you come into service and he ushers in his grace all over your life and he brings you to a higher level and you say, it was worth it. It is worth it. And all of a sudden your whole demeanor rises up and you turn to the person next to you and say, serve the Lord, praise God, live for God. And you start becoming the very thing that you needed. You become now that. You start comforting with the same comfort you received from him. Don't you yield to that scornful look or that, oh, this is all kind of dumb, isn't it? Nobody needs it. Don't you yield to that. You stand firm in the things of God. You stand for the things of God, and I assure you this. When you see him and you stand before him, you're going to love when Jesus says, I know you. <laughs> That's going to be worth something. You have not seen honor until he honors you. When you look upon the sea of multitudes of believers, think of it. Look upon the ocean. The sea of believers. It's not going to just be us there. Sea of believers. And he honors you. You honor him. Wait till he honors you. Then you'll know what honor and glory is all about. We suffer for a short time now. And we live in a country that you can't really call it suffering. Suffering today is you're just not doing what you want. We're just not being able to go out and do whatever we want. Can't go here, can't go there, can't do this, can't do that. Probably we live this, in the life of can't do. I serve the Lord of I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. Do you realize how many things in Lord God you can, you can, you can, that you once couldn't, couldn't, couldn't? There's so many things that Gary Cody once couldn't do that today I can. I could not stop wrath. And today, not an issue. But I, before, once before, had, when, it, when, I, when I wanted to prove I was angry, boy, you knew it. Because I was the man. No one messes with me. All 155 pounds of me. But all of a sudden, when God comes to your life and washes you clean, when all of a sudden you realize that there's somebody greater, when all of a sudden you realize it's God Almighty, when all of a sudden you stand and you see yourself standing before Him, when all of a sudden Revelation chapter 19, as we read earlier, as you look at Revelation chapter 19 and you realize that this whole praise thing is coming down the line, the marriage supper of the Lamb, I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed banquets. I enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy the food. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy seeing people grow in the Lord. When all of a sudden you see this marriage supper of the Lamb, I'll bet you he puts on a banquet like nobody can. Amen. And everything that we call fun today is, is, can't even be compared to the joy he has. Remember what we said last week? Exceeding riches. Waiting for those who love God. Serve the Lord. Baptism today baptizing people, I think there's 14 people that are registered that want to be baptized into the body of Christ, identified with Him, illustrating before visible and invisible that I belong to God, that there is nothing worthy serving in this world than God Almighty. I'm not going to serve anything less than Him. If that's you, boy, think of it. This is what's taking place. Going to baptize them. The Holy Spirit's going to baptize them then. But take it serious. Realize what's taking place. Receive this message. Study those scriptures. Know who he is in your life. Don't take it for granted. Don't presume on his grace. But repent today, tomorrow, until you see him. And when you take your last breath, that's when the payoff comes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Just stand before the king. And as you're doing so, would you give him a clap offering and just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you're doing and ask for your blessing. Help us, Jesus, to live for you and to walk in the Spirit as you have so ordained. For it's in your name, amen, amen. and amen. Let God's blessings be upon you throughout the day and give him honor. Amen. Praise God.